Go with me, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4, uh, we're going we're gonna to wrap up a series that we've spent 12 or so weeks now working through one of the shorter letters that Paul writes, uh, one of the more encouraging letters that Paul writes to a church that uh, he has been a part of and uh, just kind of giving them some instructions to press on, giving them some things to continue in and some things to do. And as we get to the end of it, we're going to see a very kind of implication and application based charge of Paul which which then necessitates that what we're going to do this morning is just kind of really give a very implication and application based sermon about what we've seen over and over and over again laid out in Paul's letter to the church in Philippi that we said by and large that Paul in this letter conveys three kind of overarching concepts three things that he wanted them to just drive home and stay the course in, they would be a church that finds joy in Christ and in Christ alone. That all of their joy in this world would be rooted in somebody who's not just from this world, but that they would look to Christ for joy. And that their unity would be a unity that is in Christ. That they would be a church that's united together and it wouldn't be through some superficial or artificial causes, but that they would be united because of the cause of Christ. And that they would be a church that lived, that walked out the gospel in righteousness and that that righteousness wouldn't be by simply keeping legalistic good works and doing the things according to the rules but rather that that righteousness would be found in Christ. That through Christ making us righteous we would then walk in righteousness. And so unity, joy, righteousness in Christ over and over again. He writes it. We've looked at it week after week after week and then we get to chapter 4 and he says this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I want to draw your attention a little bit to this word, therefore. If you want, you want kind of a fun project over the course of this week, uh, maybe you just go through and read Paul's letters and you just look for this word, this word, therefore. He uses it frequently. It's one of the more common words he goes back to. In fact, if you look at the letter to the Philippians, Philippians 2, he says, therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, uh, Philippians 2, verse 12, he says, so then, or therefore, it's the same word. Uh, You go on to verse 23. He says, therefore I hope to send. He's talking about Epaphroditus. Uh, You go to verse 28. Therefore I have sent him. Uh, He keeps going throughout his letter. Uh, Chapter 3 verse 15. Let us therefore have this attitude. And then in chapter 4. Therefore my beloved brethren. The very nature of this word is that it is focused on what we ought to do in light of all of the truths that have come before it. I mean, you think about how you would use that word in your day-to-day interactions. Therefore is always a word that is transitioning some case that you've made, uh, some truth that you've established, and pushing somebody to then respond to that truth. The other day, uh, I'm going to give you an example that's completely silly, but uh, but I felt like I just I, I, I'm just working. The, I'm going to tell you now. I'm just working this in because it brought some laughter to my heart, and so I'm going to tell you the story, and then we'll move on. Right? I don't have a ton of notes, but I haven't preached in a week, so maybe we'll be here two hours. We'll see. All right. Um, so Thursday night, I think it's Thursday night. My wife and I put our kids to bed. Our house is a two-story house, so the kids' bedroom, uh, girls' bedroom upstairs, Josiah's bedroom's upstairs, bathroom's upstairs. Uh, So in theory, when you put your kids to bed, they don't need anything from me. They've got toilet, sink, beds. What else do you need at night, right? That's that's the only thing I use, okay? Uh, That's never the case, right? Uh, Putting them to bed is like a six-step process, uh, one through six, lay them down, close the door, Uh, they come back down, lay them down again, close the door, they come back down, discipline, lay them down, close the door, right? Like if you're a parent, you kind of know what I'm working through. Well, this time, uh, it was, we're tired, lay them down, and like if you really can kind of muster up the energy as a parent, sometimes you try to do like some some pre-work, right? And lay them down and go, listen. Law's coming down tonight. If you come down, 
there's going to be problems, right? And so, and so I have like kind of that talk, like you will not come downstairs because it's going to be met with swift justice, right? And so uh, we lay down, it's like 20 minutes later, and you hear like, like the door open. I don't know if that, that's making sound effects now. Okay, the door opens, Clara walks out, thump, thump, thump. And you're waiting. Like, I, I feel like I'm not even breathing. I'm just waiting to, like, pounce, right? And then, like the most wonderful thing, you hear the toilet seat smack up. So she's not coming downstairs. She went to the bathroom on her own. Like, ah, oh, that's nice. I can just go to sleep. 30 seconds later, Lydia, Lydia. Lydia goes, yeah? There's no toilet paper. <laughs> Here's, here's what comes following this, right? Therefore, I need you to get up and get me a roll of toilet paper. Uh, Lydia, though, is not having it. She goes, Clara, I'm already in bed and under my covers. You know, I'm like downstairs listening to this. Clara goes, Lydia, I'm going to be on this toilet all night. <laughs> Therefore, go get me some toilet paper, right? She goes, just ask mom and dad to bring you the toilet paper. <laughs> Lydia, do you remember what they said they would do if I went downstairs? <laughs> Therefore, give me the toilet paper, right? Truth, action. I hear Lydia go, <sighs> okay, Clara, this time I will. Thump, 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 thump. <laughs> Flush. Thump, 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 thump. I didn't hear him the rest of the night. Praise the Lord, right? <laughs> Truth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait till later this afternoon I tell them they got applauded for their, their toilet escapade. <laughs> or like 10 years from now when they're teenagers and they hate me for that. Well, anyways, let's move on. So, so therefore, Paul, Paul's going to establish all of chapter 4 is really built on this foundational idea that over the first three chapters in his letter to the Philippians that Paul's built this kind of overarching case over and over and over again that we are meant to be people who find our joy in Christ, that we're meant to be people that find our unity in Christ, that we're meant to be people who find our righteousness in Christ, that these are these massive theological truths. Therefore, there's some things that it ought to do in our lives. And so today, what I want to do is just spend a few minutes looking through one by one each one of them as Paul kind of concludes his letter to the church in Philippi what does it look like to live out unity in Christ what does it look like to live out joy in Christ and what does it look like to live out righteousness in Christ and so let's just take them one by one look at the first one we said if we're meant to be a people who know the Lord in community in the church it means that we ought to be unified in Christ, that we ought to be loving and caring for one another. Therefore, how does, how does that look? What does that look like in nuts and bolts, church in Philippi, a real place, not all that dissimilar from this, say, a couple thousand years and where they're meeting at and, and not having cars, right? But, but generally, they're still people. And so what does it look like? Well, Paul talks about it like this. Pick up in verse 2. I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Here's what Paul's going to note as the first live it out unity in Christ thing is that we're meant to be people that live in harmony with one another because of the gospel. Look at, look at his request to Yodia and Syndiki, these two women, that they would live in harmony in the Lord, right? Because of the Lord, and then even in the encouragement of another, whoever it was that was receiving this letter, was going to be the first reader of this letter, that he would get involved, be a part of it, as a way of reconciling these two women who apparently have differences. We don't even know what they are, but uh, imagine... I just think about, like, this is kind of fun, right? Imagine if you and someone else are sitting in this congregation right now, and I just bust out your two names and are like, 
you guys need to just get along with each other, right? Like, because this letter is to a church being read to the church. Like, <laughs> that'd be pretty awful. I just, I'm going to just call it straight. If I'm sitting in the congregation and the pastor stands up and goes, hey, uh, Yodia Syndicate, like, figure it out, man. Fix the problem. I, you guys have got to get along. Not only is it happening in the context of the church, but like, we know them now. Right? Like, it's in the Bible. Like, that's a bummer. Now, here's, here's Paul's, <laughs> that's not like a theological exposition. That's just me thinking, okay? Uh, Paul's idea is that they would be people, and just in the same way, we as a church would be people who live in harmony with one another, not just to keep peace, but because of the Lord, right? In the Lord, because of the gospel. Not only that, but one of the ways that it plays out a lot of times in the context of our churches is that harmony with one another means that one of you sits on this side, one of you sits on this side, and you just never talk to each other. Right? Harmony with one another means that uh, you talk about one another a lot of times to people who you think are trusted, but you don't really talk to one another. I'm not, I'm not going to name any names, right? You can, you can relax, right? I'm not doing what he does. Uh, harmony, a lot of times, in what we would call it in the broken church, is a level of let's just pretend like everything's okay until we get to the parking lot. And I think that the reason Paul writes this the reason Paul sees unity in the church playing out as a deeper harmony that includes going, hey, <laughs> in case you missed this whole chapter two, in case you missed this, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any affection and compassion that you would make my joy complete, you'd be of the same mind, you'd stop doing things out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, you'd consider others as better than yourselves, you'd have this attitude in you that Jesus had in him. In case you missed all of that and said, oh yeah, I hope other people do that, he says, urge Yodia and Syndicate to get along, to live in harmony for the sake of the Lord, that you would look and say, therefore, how does this apply? It applies in our churches as people who are willing to give up their own self-interest in order to be in harmony with others. It applies when we become a people who love others enough to give up what is important to us, to give up our own selfish desires for the sake of them. And not only this, but the other thing that I think is, is really neat in this, because this doesn't play out very often in our churches, is he involves a true companion, whoever it is that's first catching this letter, that you would help these women, that you would get involved to reconcile them. Because here's what it happens a lot of times in our churches, is if you know that two people have a little bit of a feud against one another, you try to avoid it at all costs. I'm not getting involved in that, right? If you're like me, you go, I'm just, I'm going to pretend like I don't see it, I don't recognize it, I don't want to deal with it, just keep me away from that, right? And yet, Paul's encouragement is that we are meant to be people who facilitate reconciliation, not facilitate gossip, not facilitate glossing over, not facilitate avoidance, but that we would look at people we love and go, hey, how can we help this situation? How can we bring reconciliation to this situation? How can we fix this situation? This is almost entirely what marital counseling looks like in my life. I do marital counseling all the time. I do, I do two types of marital I do premarital counseling. That looks like trying to get rid of delusions, right, and, and help people be grounded in reality. Like, it's not going to be as good as you think it is, right? Uh, and I do... <laughs> If you're engaged, I'm sorry, you know, it's okay, right? It's, it's not as bad as it could, as, as some of the post-marital counseling people are going to say it is, right? Because that's the other side of it, is everything is so broken and everything is so awful. And sometimes, you know what we find in marital counseling a lot? Sometimes all you need to open up communications is somebody else who's going, I'll help you reconcile this. I'll sit here. All I, all I do is ask questions 90% of the time. 
and people who sit next to each other, people who love, and, and we're talking about husbands and wives. We're not talking about church members. You care a lot more about your husband or your wife than you do most church members. And all I do is sit there and ask questions and watch people be reconciled. That's what Paul's saying. Unity in Christ is a church that loves, another, loves one another enough in harmony in the gospel that they would desire to see that harmony facilitated and if it takes as much to bring others along to reconcile, to be somebody who continues to bring about that harmony. If we want to be a church that really lives out unity, we're not only going to love one another, but we're going to look at some people that we go, ah, I got some tension, I have some differences with this person, and go, is there something I can do to be reconciled to my brother? Jesus said it this way. In fact, he said, if you're going to go to the temple and you've got a sacrifice to give at the altar, which was how Jews worshipped, he said, and, and you remember that your brother and you have a feud, that you've got something against one another, that you shouldn't even offer up worship at the temple. You leave it there and you go, you first be reconciled to your brother. Then you can come offer worship. And so I don't, I don't know where you're at today, but I'm going to guess that you can think, some of you, not all of you, I'm not trying to guilt trip you into something, but some of you can think about and look at and go, ah, oh, there's, there's just this kind of awkward tension that I have with so-and-so. Or I see these two people that just seem like they're at odds with one another. And maybe you need to pray about it, but maybe you just need to go and say, hey, I want to love you and I want to live in harmony with you for the sake of the gospel. I want us to be a church that moves forward in harmony. And I don't know what that looks like. You're going to have to use some wisdom in the Holy Spirit for each of you to know. But what you see Paul playing out in the how do you live out unity in Christ, it's a great desire for harmony with one another and it includes us being people who help reconcile one another, who help bring people to a place where we love one another for the sake of Christ in the Lord. Not only that, but if you notice, and so I'm going to come back to the next few verses, but I want you to skip down a little bit because there's another piece of unity that Paul mentions in the how do you live it out. Look at verse 10. He says, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly now that at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I, I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and also I know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. Paul uh, continues on for a few more verses about this, but he says, here's, here's what unity in Christ looks like. It looks like you recognizing that I, in prison in Rome, doing ministry, could use some support. And so you took a person from your church, Epaphroditus, and gave him a large and valuable gift and sent him to me and said, share this with Paul. And it advanced my ministry. And so if we're going to live out unity in Christ, what Paul notes and what it looks like is one, a harmony with one another, a desire to live together, a desire to be reconciled amongst differences for the sake of the Lord, and a generosity towards one another that exceeds only our selfish needs and selfish desires, that the church in Philippi becomes a leader in all circumstances in Paul's ministry. He even says at one point when he's in Thessalonica that they're one of the only churches that are giving to him, that they're using it as a way to support his ministry, sacrificing of themselves for the sake of others. You want to know marks of unity in Christ? One is a desire to live in harmony with others, and another is a generosity towards others that is willing to give even of your own supply or your own need to see the gospel advance. I can tell you that if you are not generous, and if you don't value harmony, that as Paul is noting here, you won't watch and you won't witness a whole lot of fruit spiritually in your life. It just, it just consistently comes up true. Because you don't desire anybody else's needs more than your own. 
Therefore, you want to live out unity, you become someone who cares about others, desires harmony with others, and is generous towards others. But the other overarching theme, not just unity in Christ, but also Paul talks about joy being in Christ. And so he goes on in verse 4 and says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Therefore, how do we live out joy? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If we want to live out joy, it comes through rejoicing in the Lord. And, and listen, we've, we've said this over and over again for 12 weeks, and, and I'll say it over and over again uh, as long as I possibly can because you need to hear this. Biblical joy, joy in Christ, the joy that Paul's talking about is not happiness emotively. It's not you feeling chipper or cheery. Because if you've lived some time, you know this to be true. The moments of most intense and deepest joy don't elicit laughter. It elicits tears. The moments of deepest joy in our life are almost always accompanied by tears. Good and bad, right? I think some of the most joyous times of my life have been worshiping the God, the God that I love in ways so much deeper than uh, fluffy, chipper attitudes. I think about when my children were born and joy producing tears in me. I think about my wedding day and joy producing tears in me. I think about some of the funerals that I've been a part of and out of joy, weeping and producing deep mourning and tears. When Paul says rejoice in the Lord always and ask the Lord for joy, he's not saying that God's gonna make you feel happy, but rather that there are markers of what it looks like to live out deep joy. Look at, look at what he writes. Verse 5, a gentle spirit that would be known to all men. Real joy, biblical joy is that you would be reasonable. You would have a gentle spirit. You wouldn't be someone who is high and low, tossed aside by every circumstance of life, but rather that you would recognize what Pastor Dave talked about last week, that our citizenship is in heaven, that we don't get so kilter, off kilter, tipped aside from one way to the next every time something good or something bad happens to us because, look at what he reminds us of, the Lord is near, that we're not worried about all of the things of this world, that we would have a gentle spirit, that's a spirit of joy, that we would, look at verse 6, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let our requests be made known to God, that we wouldn't be constantly anxious and worried about all the things this world could offer us because God overcome the world. We don't, we don't have to worry about that that we would take it to him and trust him. Joy is somebody who trusts the Lord. And then he, he adds this one in here. I just I, I want to just note a minute on this. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. I think a thankful heart is absolutely necessary if you're going to have joy in Christ. Amen? Because here's, here's what happens when you're not a thankful person. You complain about everything. And here's what happens if you complain about everything. No one wants to be around you. If you can't think of somebody that like visually kind of pops up in your head, you go, oh no, that's kind of sinful. Don't think of that person. Uh, if that didn't happen to you, maybe you are that person. I'm, trying, I'm not trying to like... Again, I'm going to get in trouble. All right, I got to go off script a little too much here. Okay, in this, right, 
If you don't have an attitude of thanksgiving, if you're not someone who's thankful, what happens is everything that happens in and around you becomes something that you feel entitled to. Everything that happens in and around you feels like something that you should get. And everything bad that happens to you feels like some great injustice has been done to you because you live with no gratitude. And when you live with no gratitude and you feel like every bad circumstance is a woe is me, great injustice, it makes you somebody who is void of all joy. And when you're void of all joy, you know what happens? The church doesn't want to be around you because we are attracted to the joy that is in Christ. If you want to have joy in Christ, note Paul commands it. Note that he says it's supplied not through our work but through prayer in Christ, that it only comes from Christ and that it doesn't look like feeling smiley and happy all the time. It looks like someone who is of gentle spirit, not anxious, and is thankful. That joy lived out is one that lives out and possesses the peace of God which surpasses understanding, guarding your heart in all circumstances because they will not all be good circumstances. Unity in Christ, joy in Christ, and then he doesn't leave it. Therefore, how do we live out righteousness in Christ? Look at verse eight. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellent and anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. These things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, Paul, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. That we would dwell on the things that are righteous, the things that are godly, the things are of good repute. It is impossible. It is impossible and this is why it's so frustrating for so many of you. It is impossible to divorce unity in Christ and joy in Christ with a righteousness in Christ. You will not accomplish unity in Christ and you will not have fulfilling joy in Christ if you're living a life of unrighteous, unrepentant sin. You just won't. You just won't go out and live a reckless and selfish and self-gratifying life, not dwelling on the things of God, not desiring anything righteous in your life and then come and expect to have joy in Christ and unity in Christ. It's just not gonna be there because they're intimately tied together. It's why Paul brings them all together as he concludes his letter that we should be joyous in Christ, that we should be unified in Christ, that we should be righteous in Christ, and that all of them should work in harmony for one another, and that's what it looks like to live out the gospel. And the greatest news of all, this is, and we'll close with this, the best thing about this is all throughout the letter, over and over and over again, he's going to remind us that the best news about it is you can't do it on your own. It's God doing it in you. It's the work of the Lord producing these things in you and so you don't just walk more legalistically. You don't just walk following more rules. You don't just walk trying harder. You turn to the Lord. In chapter one, he said it this way in verse six. I'm confident of this very thing that he, God, who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. In chapter two, he said it the same way. Uh, verse 13, verse, we'll, and we'll pick up in verse 12. It says, so then, or therefore, my beloved, just as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That means bring forth the full fruit of your salvation. Live out your salvation in fear and trembling. And then he reminds us of this, because he doesn't want you to think that you can do it on your own, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Verse, or chapter three, when Paul talks about whatever things were gained to him, he counted as lost for the sake of Christ. He concludes this, that he may be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, 
but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Paul says it this way. You want joy. You want unity. You want righteousness. The most dangerous thing you could do is think that by works of the law, by your hard work, you could accomplish it. The way that it is found is in Christ. That you would stop trying to operate in your own power, but that you would look to the Lord who has started a good work in you and is going to bring it to completion. And you'd stop relying on yourself and you'd start pressing into him. You'd look to him for your gentle spirit. You'd look to him for your harmony amongst others. You'd look to him for your thanksgiving. You'd look to him to remove anxiousness and put peace in your life. That it will all be found in him because he is at at work in you. I don't know where you're at this morning. The reality is in a room this big, we are all across the board. I think there's some of you who have been walking with the Lord for years and years and years, decades and decades, and you need to be reminded that to walk in a manner worthy of a gospel of Christ is to trust him. There's some of you who maybe have just recently given your life to Christ. And you need to be reminded that it's not simply a momentary decision that you've made, but that it's the beginning of what it looks like to work out your salvation, to bring forth fruit from your new relationship in Christ, that it should produce in you joy, that it should produce in you a love for others, that it should produce in you a righteousness found in Christ. And then I think there's probably a third group of you who have lived your life working really hard to be good. Working really hard to find joy. Working really hard to find righteousness. Working really hard to find some type of unity, some type of community that means anything in your life. And you tried so hard to be good and you tried so hard to do it and you can't understand why that joy feels so empty, so half-baked. And you can't understand why the communities that you have tried to connect to just feel so artificial. And you can't understand why as hard as you try to be good, to do righteous things, you keep failing. And maybe you're there, and I'm telling you, what you need to do is you need to place your faith in Christ, not in yourself. You need to decide that all of these works that you've been doing, all of this hard work that you've been doing, you can count as loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, your Lord. And you need to just place your faith in him as your Lord today. And so I'm going to pray. The band's going to come up. We're going to play and sing one more song. And I'm going to give you time to do some business with God. Maybe it's while I pray in a moment. Maybe it's while we sing this last song. Maybe it's on your drive home today. But regardless of where you're at, I think as we, as we kind of wrap up this idea and close up this book of Philippians... I want to challenge you to be a people that would look to joy, unity, and righteousness and see them that things ultimately only Christ provides.